All right. Um, so quick intro about me. Uh, I did some work uh, years ago as an intern with Plan Sebal in Uruguay. That's their uh, one laptop per child project. And that gave me the idea to try and do the slides in Spanish. So we'll see how that works. I'm going to keep talking in English. I've worked on some different open source projects, including maps like OpenStreetMap. Uh, and recently, I am trying new things, including this presentation and looking for a new job. In this presentation, there are three parts. I'm going to talk about the biology, talk about recent stuff with large language models, and then some of my own projects and whether they're working or not. And I'll try to slow down a little bit. That's just the intro. OK. Um, so this wall of text is an example of DNA. And it's amazing now that in our lifetimes, we've gotten the technology that you can go online and download the genome of so many different plants and animals, or you can order your own genome through different services. But then you download this gigabyte of text and open it up, and it looks like this. And you're wondering, wait, what can I do with this? I don't know where to start. There's no commas. It's not a CSV file, right? Um, so I became curious about this. What could I do with it? And what are people doing with it in the world? Uh, yeah. So this is another way of looking at a DNA data set. This is the charts down here are an example of a genome browser. This one is for rice. Uh, and so this is like the larger section, and this is the subsection that's highlighted. And within that, there are proteins. Well, they're genes that code for proteins. And if they have a name or a description or some other annotation, then they'll be listed next to them. So that green one has a name and some information on it. These yellow ones, they know that they're genes that code for something, but they don't have information on the browser. And then in between are thousands and thousands of pairs of DNA, which, you know, when we were in school, maybe they told us it was junk DNA or just non-coding DNA. But it turns out to be really important. It's sort of helping structure where the DNA is in the nucleus and when things get copied and expressed or not. Um, but yeah, inside of those uh, genes, every three pairs is called a codon. And there's a start codon. And then each codon after that represents an amino acid that's going to be put into the protein. And then there's a stop codon. And just since we're programmers, I, you, there's this thought that, oh, it's going to go from start to finish, and it's going to be a neat like, programming language. But actually, there are all sorts of strange things in your own DNA right now, including palindromes and overlapping genes that are just frame shifted from each other, right? because every three. So somehow, that was able to be structured in a way that we have these genes inside of ourselves, and they're working uh, just based on where the copying starts. Uh, when we talk about biology, uh, I tried to kind of organize the things that people talk about into different categories. The first one being stuff that we learned about in school, the things that are really well known. So example of this would be, oh, if one of these DNA pairs is mutated, then you have this condition or you have this uh, trait. And if you ha don't have it, then you don't have it. It's just like on-off switch on a particular gene. So that's pretty straightforward to understand. Then the next category would be kind of where research is going right now. So there's some innovation around this where uh, this is a system where I sent in my DNA and they say that I don't have a very good sleep cycle. Uh, it says second percentile. And there's not one gene that codes for that, but 80 plus genes that they've attached some positive or negative score to by studying large populations. So this is really revelatory, but if I wanted to like gene edit my way better to a better sleep, I couldn't just, I don't know what these individual genes are doing. It'd be very irresponsible for me to just go around flipping 80 something switches. So that's sort of just understanding how our, our what is connected to these traits, but we don't really understand what the individual pieces are doing. And there's also some cool stuff with protein folding, and I'm trying to represent CRISPR a little bit here, which is um, cut, copy, and paste different pieces of DNA into a sequence. Uh, and then the final category would be speculation. So these are real sciences of epigenetics and understanding that DNA that's in between genes. And there's real science in um, 
gene drives and things. But if you heard something cool on a podcast about epigenetics, it might not necessarily be true. Um, so we're kind of, we're still working on, if anyone tells you definitively about it, including myself, then there, there's still a long way to go. So yeah, this talk is about quinoa, uh, big choice. Um, so yeah, so what is quinoa? Where is it from? So quinoa is a grain which comes from Peru and Bolivia. And um, let me see what I say. it's related to uh, caniwa, which is also in Peru and Bolivia, and huazontles. Is anyone from Puebla? It's like a very local uh, food. I had some the other day, so huazontles. Uh, and one thing that's interesting about the quinoa genome, which makes it a little longer for them to sequence it uh, in the past few years, is that it's a hybrid of two other plants. And you might think, oh, it's like, you know, the mommy plant and the daddy plant, it's like a little bit of each. But actually, it's the whole genome of each plant got merged together. So each chromosome has four copies, two from each, like, original plant. And that sounds pretty wild if you just think back to school. But this turns out to happen sometimes in plants. And actually, it's very common in plants that we eat. And people don't really understand why that is. Um, so... Lots of people are researching this professionally that know what they're doing, and uh, these research centers are scattered around the world. Uh, not far from us in Texcoco is the Center for Wheat and Maize that actually did really landmark research with the Green Revolution varieties of those crops. The International Potato Center is in Lima, so they also do some quinoa stuff there. And then uh, there's different rice centers in the Philippines and Colombia. Um, so yeah, why would these different groups around the world outside of Peru and Bolivia be interested in quinoa? I'm not going to make any like health or nutrition claims because I'm not a scientist there. Um, but something that's interesting about that is that when these research groups around the world have to study climate change and what could they do if the rice crop on the Mekong Delta is failing, they say, well, let's do a research project where we grow quinoa because it works in hot conditions, dry conditions, high altitude, low altitude, high salt levels. You know, there's different things they can do with quinoa that they're not able to do with other crops. I think also there's a value in researching the traditional agriculture behind quinoa. You know, even though we're talking about genetics and all this, I mean, people were growing quinoa for thousands of years in the Incan Empire, so it would be useful to learn something about those practices. Um, so I mentioned there's these other centers for kind of the more major cash crops. And, you know, they, the way that genetics research has typically been working is they'll say, oh, this is a very interesting variety of wheat that we have. Let's study the genome and find what gene is relative to that. So there's a lot of genetic research that follows the traditional research. Since there are fewer studies about quinoa, it's still kind of on the cusp of getting real information. So there's a paper this year just about what part of the genome seems to be responsible for white, red, and black quinoa and other traits that seem pretty important if you're like trying to understand what's going on in there. And I should say it also has like the basic cell and plant starter pack of genes that they can find in other plants and say this means this, this means this. But there are hundreds to thousands of other genes that could be identified by traditional research or maybe by some kind of machine learning practice of understanding what similar genes are interesting in other plants. And before I get too deep into the large language models, there is technology out there already for people who are bioinformatics experts, and uh, that still is an ongoing practice and would be much more accurate than these models that are kind of coming out now. Um, but I think kind of like NLP and computer vision were changed by going from individual tools to kind of a general large language model informed by large amounts of data, something similar might be able to happen here. Okay. Um, see, I, I, I cannot see what I wrote on my slides, so okay. Um, so there's a bunch of different language models which came out that are specifically trained on DNA. The ones that are relevant to this talk would be AgroNT, which is trained, like pre-trained on specifically plant and crop DNA. Uh, the EVO, which is a project from Stanford, 
it's uh, trained on the prokaryotes, like bacteria and such, but they specifically took out uh, viruses and bacteria that would be harmful to humans. They don't want the language model to learn about that. Uh, and then the last project is Caduceus, which is using the new Mamba architecture, which doesn't use transformers. Um, so they're all kind of going in different directions. And it's happening very quickly as well. The uh, AgroNT project was released last September, and it's a 1,000 million parameter model and it has 1,000 tokens of context. So 1,000 base pairs of DNA isn't very much in terms of information. So they've made each token represent six base pairs. So a single word or token in these language models might be ACT, ACT. It's like one token. Um, but since then, like six months later, this Evo project was able to make use of new developments in language models and have a context of 131,000 tokens. So that's using individual nucleotides. Um, and it's also many more parameters of, in the model. Um, so yeah, the different strategies for how to divide DNA into tokens, what we're training it on, and then uh, next question would be how do they find out if it's working? So these are the evaluations that they've uh, attached to their papers to show we made a language model, not just for fun, but that has some apl application. So the AgroNT paper um, is more of like a BERT-like model. You can use it in the transformers system for um, sequence classification. And so they have different tasks like a long non-coding RNA and gene expression. Um, what was I gonna say about this? Yeah, so, but they still have that limit of 6,000 base pairs of context to work with. Uh, with Evo, they've created more like a GPT model, and I don't fully understand the way they've set this up on their repo, but rather than evaluating it like a classification model, they kind of have it look at the perplexity of different sequences and use that as a substitute for, oh, this looks correct, this looks incorrect, you know, you changed this gene and it, this, you changed these base pairs and it matters a lot or it doesn't matter a lot. They're trying to derive something from the perplexity of that model. Okay, now we get to move on to my own kind of experiments in this space. So there's sort of a sequence of letters on the left side there. So the step up from sequencing, doing a DNA language model would be to be focusing just on those genes or the proteins that they create. So fortunately, there are 22 amino acids and four DNA base pairs. So they've come up with an alphabetic system, A to Z, to represent those like amino acids within a protein. And then once you have that sequence, there are some models out there that place them into an embedding. So I, I don't know if you do a lot with uh, machine learning models in your space, but it essentially puts it somewhere in vector space so that you could compare two sequences and find out are they close to each other or are they kind of clustered together, that kind of thing, in like thousand dimensional space. It's better not to think about a thousand dimensions. But, um, so what I did is I got the embeddings that existed from Uniprot. There's a website, Uniprot, that has proteins from different species and plants around the world and retrained a model on them but using a newer technique called Matryoshka embeddings, which puts more of the information towards the front. So you can kind of do a search in just the first like 100 dimensions to kind of find similar things before, instead of trying to calculate against thousands of dimensions of different things against each other. Um, so that essentially, the embeddings mostly follow each other except for some weirdness around like distances that were supposed to be zero or something like that. So then the, let's see. Yeah, the next idea I had was maybe I could get one of these smaller large language models, this one called Tiny Llama, and have it train on those protein alphabetic sequences and also still have um, like natural language text in English. And the reason you might want to do that is what if we could like ask questions or ask for an explanation or when it comes up with an output, look at the uh, attention 
in the model to find out what it's looking at within the sequence. Um, so different ideas about what could be done with like a mixed modal model. And the first section here is like the correct description of a gene or, or of a protein. And then this one is one that it generated. Uh, so it gets the vibe, it gets like the like idea or theme of generating this text. It's telling me where it belongs in the cell and what parts of the plant are going to have this protein. They're all wrong. But it's, it's so it's, I, I don't know if it needs more training or this is something that needs to be specialized more. Or maybe I could look at the probabilities to see if it's starting to pick up these things. Um, so this is still a longer way from being completed, but I think would be really interesting if you could just interact with it as a language model. Uh, this is a similar third idea, which is um, taking Llama 3, which is a pretty large language model, like 8,000 million parameters, and then adding tokens for DNA, like A, C, G, and T. So it's not trained on these tokens before, and it doesn't know how to, how to interact with them. But then if I run like a adapter model on it, it should develop some sort of understanding of at least where they belong in this sequence. Um, so I'm able to get it to generate different things with this, but again, it's not really performant on the benchmarks that I found from AgroNT. So maybe this is something that I should start from one of the DNA specific models and then work backward to natural language or something in the middle, not really clear. But yeah, future ideas would be something like that, merging models that already work well on DNA and natural text. Um, one thing I could do is that if you remember that genome browser back in the beginning, which organized the proteins, I haven't found one online for quinoa because it's more niche. So maybe I could use one of these open source tools to put that online. Uh, I've also, the data set that I use to train the model, I put it on up uh, on Hugging Face. So maybe I could expand that or use that as a evaluation for other language models. Like are they learning description? Can they describe these proteins? Or maybe I need to keep processing that. So if you remember back to the description, it's kind of a longer description. I could probably break this down into like five Q&A things for the model to solve rather than saying, you know, free form response. Um, yeah, then other ideas is like setting up uh, evaluations. Like imagine, like as soon as we walked out of this room, Google says we have this billion trillion parameter model. Like what would I test it with? So I'm calling this win infrastructure. Like if, is it winning? Like what could we build around this? And I think if it can identify genes that are helpful against diseases or insects or drought, that would be helpful. Or if it can identify genes in wild versions of these plants. That's a big research thing for the potato center as they look at wild plants, try to like bring genes back if they're helpful. Um, so different ideas like that. Um, yeah, this, this is the summary because we're running low on time, so I want to get to questions. And these slides are online. They have lots of different resources. These aren't just like, here's my source. It's more like, here's where that language model is. And uh, here's like, videos of people talking about like plant varieties and things. Um, so yeah, muchas gracias a todos. I figured since it's quinoa, I should end with like a link to a recipe. So <laughs> this is a recipe that I've made. If you're a quinoa hater, you can try it. Um, and then you can also, if you get the cereal, you can make them into like Rice crispy Treats. This is a thing. So yeah, that's it, thank you. I don't know if you, is it a short question? Okay. On idea three, you mentioned uh, adding an adapter on top of Llama 3. Can you explain a little bit more what you meant by an adapter in that context? All right, yes. So the, essentially the way that language model training works if you're a megacorp is you do have all the GPUs and everything to just do straight up training, not as much text and data as you want. But if I wanted to adapt it, I have a separate project where I adapt it to answer questions about New York City. 
and I only have one GPU on Colab. And the way that I'm able to fit a larger language model into this one GPU is there's techniques called quantization, where they take away some bits from different values. And then there's a separate idea of let's freeze those like values, like we don't change those values, but we do add like additional like deltas to the model. So that's what we're training is kind of like a like put the hat on the language model and it'll behave differently. So that works well for like text where you're saying talk like a pirate, talk like you're from New York, something. It doesn't work well for like images or like something brand new. So I was trying to kind of split the difference by saying let's make an adapter that does, you know, it's still like a 10 gigabyte adapter. Uh, and it doesn't seem to be working very well. So I think it, something in this direction could work. But yeah, this is a technique people use to train just kind of like part of the language model.